Hi, everyone. My life has really been centered at the intersection of two technologies, genetic engineering and computing. Really, I've spent all of my life there, and I've been fortunate that I can just focus on those two areas more than most. Hi, Tom. It turns out, at least for me, that they're pretty, pretty similar, and I'll tell you here why. I got to the forefront of biotechnology actually fairly quickly with a large pharmaceutical company, and I was a little frustrated when I got there because I realized the business model wasn't going to allow us to make medicines faster or cheaper. For 60 years, they hadn't found a way to accelerate. And so I retired. This was 10 years ago, and I went to a beach in Thailand, and I sat around and I looked at people working on their computers, and I said, what are you doing? And they said, oh, I'm writing a program. I'm writing a book. And I thought, I want to be able to do genetic engineering on a beach in Thailand. <laughs> I want to be able to make cancer medicines from here as easily as I was writing a computer program. We all know computers. It started with this, 1948, the first transistor. I wasn't there, but I did join the computer revolution when it got to be literally integrated circuits. And we know what happened when, as computers started to evolve. We started to get innovators coming into the field and they started to make really powerful tools at affordable prices, which ultimately created a new wave of creative inspiration that we're still riding today. Companies like Google, Mark Zuckerberg, who figured out it's not really computers that want to connect, it's the people in front of them. And now the web literally connects our lives in ways that we're still learning to understand. They're, we're seeing how it affects not just the way our computers are connected, it's the way we connect now. Everything is connected. We can share information in ways never before. And now we're starting to scan even deeper. We're scanning all of physical reality. We're able to modify it with software tools and now we're starting to print it, too. This is a seamless connection now between the real and the virtual, and then back to the real, now mashed up and modified. Where does this go? I don't really know, but I'm pretty sure it's just cyborgs. <laughs> lots and lots of cyborgs. But wait. Really, biology, computers are one thing, but this, I've always tried to remember, is a living world. All those machines, all the stuff that we make, and it's not really that important, other than the fact that it does connect us and allow us to learn in ways that we've never really learned before. The foundation of this living world actually started about four billion years ago. It's microscopic. We don't think about it very much. But it's the microbes, the bacteria, the first viruses. There are more bacteria on this planet than we can imagine. There's more bacteria in and on you than you can imagine. Ten times more bacterial cells, approximately, than your own cells. They're the foundation of us. They're the foundation of all living things. You look at E. coli bacteria, like in this micrograph, and they don't look that special. In fact, they kind of just look like sausages, <laughs> which will forever change the way you look at breakfast. <laughs> really. But what I found fascinating about them is between those cells and a modern cell phone, there's not really all that much difference. They're powerful processors of chemical information, incredibly complicated. They are aware of their environment. They work better when they're networked, although they can be used as standalone. They're incredible sensory devices and communication devices, and we're just still learning how they operate, just these incredibly simple cells that are billions of years old. We understand today that there's an architecture in biology that's actually really similar to our computer architecture. 
I saw it a little bit earlier than some people because, again, I, my life was at the intersection of cell biology, genetics, and electronics. But I've learned that it really doesn't matter whether you take components and build them up into more complex circuits and ultimately computers and then network those computers, or start working with simple biological compounds, ultimately making pathways, ultimately making a living cell, and then networking those cells to make multicellular organisms, and having those organisms, again, interact with networks of other organisms. The two architectures are the same, if the, even if the mediums are a little different. Seen this way, you are a network. You are an internet of hundreds of trillions of cells working together. It's really quite remarkable. But now we've got a whole new generation of people that are growing up digital, and they just see this architecture really easily. This is the operating system of a bacterium. Five megabits, incredibly dense. At the heart of it is DNA, probably one of the most studied molecules on the planet. This is, we've been researching this molecule indirectly for thousands of years with breeding programs, directly since we discovered the structure and started to understand the code. But really, it's just software. Software that makes hardware. And we're getting really good now at reading it. This is a desktop device that'll read a genome in about a day. It's about the size of a laser printer. It's moving forward to smaller devices. And eventually, you see where this goes. It'll go to your cell phone. It'll be real time. We're starting to make CAD programs, literally computer-aided design programs, for starting to write biology as well. This, again, through the lens of genetic code, through this software. And ultimately, we can print it with companies like this that, are, that literally run printers that take electronic files to 3D print the DNA molecule that can then go into the lab and do that researchers can use for genetic engineering. This is incredibly powerful. I came from a biotech world where to do this type of work cost billions of dollars and took laboratories filled with expensive PhDs. Now if you can type, you can be a genetic engineer. Life is becoming programmable, and I think this is one of the most powerful shifts the world has ever seen, because life already covers this planet. And as we start to be able to manipulate it, where does it go? Biology is the next IT industry. We're still living with the paradigm shifts that the present IT industry is delivering on us almost every day, and yet, this one is emerging, built on that foundation of electronics, of social media. There's big companies involved in this, but it's the small ones that I find interesting. These are students at MIT. They come from all over the world to learn this program. It was one team of students 10 years ago. Now there's hundreds. There's been 10,000 alumni through this program. This is a whole new programming industry kind of appearing bottom up. You probably haven't even, you're not aware of them yet. And it's even coming to the individual within reach. This is a researcher that started his own biotech company, licensed in legal, in a bedroom. It's fascinating. It's just like home computing, except now the question is, what do you go make? Well, the professionals, when they started getting their hands on this technology, started to write small genomes, the smallest being viruses. And the first virus was booted up in 2002. They graduated to bacteria, a little bit bigger genome. And the state of the art now is working with this organism, which you're all familiar with. It's baker's yeast. It's the foundation of beer. I know you can make bread with it, too. but. Beer is the important one. <laughs> Seriously, this is so much fun. So now we have a distribution system. It'll be a couple of years before they boot up the synthetic yeast. But yeast is a lot closer to us than we are to bacteria. We're learning a lot in the process. 
glow-in-the-dark cats, you know they're coming. <laughs> They've already been made, but you'll be able to buy them at your pet store. Where does this go from here? Well, obviously, it's cyborgs with glowing cats. <laughs> And yeah, we'll probably get around to booting up a few extinct organisms too. This takes us way past what Darwin taught us. This is way beyond natural selection, survival of the fittest. Now we get to participate in what we create and what survives, why we make it. We have to take responsibility for this shift. It's a big shift for humanity. I don't want to underscore it. We don't know how to do it because we've never done it. But we'll learn. We're smart. My own focus was in cancer. I had worked with a biotech company focused on cancer. Cancer powers most of the research that's done in genetics. It's the idea that we'll be able to fix cancer cells. And why not? Cancer cells really are just a corruption of the genetic program. That's normal. Corruption happens on any computing system on any network. We know it. We're all familiar with it. We've seen stuff like this. This computer's still running. It's just not running well. That's what cancer is. How do we go and change that? Well, I knew how do we, it's not really what you throw at it. It's whether you can just hit the right target. It's how you find the bad apple, the different apple, in a hundred trillion different apples. It's a hard job. I don't want to minimize it. We've been working on it for 40 years. But I know this. Viruses, those tiniest genomes that we were able to engineer, are incredibly specific. They were used as antibiotics in Georgia and other places in the world for a long time because they can actually infect a specific type of bacterium. And now we're getting so good at being able to read these small genomes and to be able to write these small genomes, some people have actually started to engineer viruses as cancer therapies, leveraging on this incredible specificity of the virus to home in on a particular cell, and in this case, actually use the cancer cell sometimes to manufacture more drug. I think this is great. It's an incredible opportunity to use a biological agent to go after another biological agent. But I want to see it go open source. I want to see it become available for everybody to be able to go and do this type of work. In the same way that computers became really widely available and started all this creativity, I want to see that come to biotech. I want to see pills to treat everything eventually be made with this technology. I see on the forefront personal medicines made for you or you or you based on your genome, based on your life, based on your experience, programmed just for you in the same way that just about everything gets personalized in the digital world. Not snake oil, effective, scientifically proven, tested on your own cells and tissues, on you made fast, because everything in the computer world is made fast, and moreover, made cheap, because now it's just not a handful of companies. It's everybody. This scares a lot of people, this vision, this idea of genetic engineering for everyone. And if it scares you, good, good. Get involved, learn a little, think about it. Decide what you want. Personally, I think cancer is awfully scary. I also grew up in a time when those computers that we all take for granted back in the early days were considered a potential threat, that people with access to computers would hack their way into missile silos and start World War III. And let's not forget the cyborgs <laughs> that hunted us down and killed us. I wouldn't mind making ter terminators for cancer. I think that's where we're going. I don't think it's anything that we should fear. And on this foundation, I think we're going to change the world, all of us, 
not just me, not just the scientists, everyone that gets involved in learning how to do this. That's a big idea. Thank you.